I want you to imagine you're coming up to a traffic light. And I'm going to need your help here from what I, I want a little participation. You're going to have to fill in the blank for me, okay? But to, to do this, you need to imagine you're coming up to a traffic light. If it's green, you you go. If it's red, you stop. If it's yellow, you yes, accelerate. I thought a lot of you would say that. Yeah, I'm afraid a lot of you would say that, wouldn't you? Yellow means limited approval, right? Yellow's like limited a- approval. It's not a no, but it's to proceed with caution. It's like yellow's not a no, but, but, but yellow means proceed with caution and apply discernment. That's what it is for yellow. You know, traffic lights are really helpful for driving. The imagery of a traffic light is also really helpful for disciple making. To know what you're going to do when you encounter a red light, a yellow light, a green light. And here's what I mean by that. There's a great example of this in Acts chapter 17. The Apostle Paul is in Athens. He's in Athens, Greece, and and he's noticed the city is full of idols. It's just filled with false gods. He's disturbed by this. He's bothered by this. They don't know the one true God that he has come to know. And so he goes to the meeting of the Areopagus, and there at that meeting, Paul shares with them about the one true God, the one that is unknown to them. And then he shares with them about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to prove who he was. And here's where the text picks up in Acts 17, 32. It says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered red light. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Yellow light. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Green light. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. There's the graphic of the traffic light that is somewhat helpful in us understanding people's responses to the gospel, responses to the message of Jesus. Because in the text, we read that, that some were no. They sneered. They were red lights. They were not interested. What do you do when that happens? What's your response? Well, just keep searching for a, a person of peace who's going to have an open heart to the message. It's okay. You just, you just move on to someone who might be open. Some were intrigued. They, their answer was maybe. It was a yellow light. We'd like to maybe hear more about this. It, it, it was limited approval. And whenever that happens, what do you do when you encounter someone who's a yellow light? Well, maybe. I might be interested in hearing more. Well, use that as an opportunity to invite them into a a Bible discovery group. That's what you do next when you find someone who's a yellow light, who's interested in perhaps learning more. And then there were those who, they were yes, they believed. They were green lights. What do you do with a green light? Again, you invite them into a discovery Bible study so they can learn more, so they can have greater understanding of who Jesus is and begin to not only be a disciple, but to make disciples. Three responses to the gospel that Paul encountered. But you know what? There's, there might be a fourth response you might encounter that wasn't one of the three that Paul encountered because you're in a different situation. He was going into a place where there were no believers. It was an unreached place. They were hearing the gospel for the first time. But it's possible you might be sharing with someone and find out that, in fact, they're a Christian. They're already a believer. And so what do you do? You you equip and train them so that they can know how to make disciples. It's helpful when you know where people are. And maybe today, maybe today you're here, and honestly, just using that little imagery there, you could say deep down inside, I'm a red light. Like, I came in town for Thanksgiving. I didn't know church was on the agenda. I feel somewhat obligated, and I'm just, I found myself at church today. It wasn't in the plan, and I'm really not interested. And maybe you're here today. Maybe you're listening right now, and you just be like, I'm a red light. And you know what? It's okay, but my, my prayer, my prayer is that, that you would encounter God in a powerful way where you would be like Paul, who he too was a red light. He was completely opposed to Christ. He wasn't just a red light. He was, he was keeping everybody else from coming to Christ. I mean, he, he, was like a, he was like a crossing guard just trying to get everybody to stop. And, but he encountered God, Jesus, in a powerful way. And, and not only did he become a green light, he began sharing Jesus with everybody he could because he was a changed person. 
And that's just my prayer for you. Maybe that's what could happen. Maybe today you're kind of a yellow light, like you're checking things out, you're intrigued. Maybe you were invited and you're here. And, and so my prayer is that we could use this as an opportunity to help equip and train even more and let you know more about who Jesus is and that you would come to know him. And maybe you're a green light, man. You, you believe you're ready to receive everything that God wants to do and praise God for that. And I, I, I pray that for you, you'll become one of those that will help other yellow lights and green lights know what it means to follow Jesus. And maybe you're already a believer and you're here and you're listening and you're already a believer, you're a follower of Jesus, then I want to help you today have some tools to know how you can help a yellow light or a green light know how to follow Jesus and help other people follow Jesus who help other people follow Jesus. And that's really what we want to talk about today because I get excited when I hear about people who are just taking simple, obedient, steps of faith, and in so doing, not only are they following Jesus, but they're helping other people follow Jesus. So I overheard a story this week, and I want you to hear the story too. So I've asked JR if he would come up here, because JR was in John's office, and he was just talking about something that had happened at work, and I kind of walked up as the story there was unfolding, they were sharing it with me, and I was just like, JR, this is exactly what I'm talking about this Sunday that I want to lead into. And so uh, I just wanted JR just to share kind of his work story and kind of how that unfolded because it is so applicable to, to what we want to talk about, about what, what do you do next? How do you step into this? So just share with us what happened. All right, so I, I work in the manufacturing industry uh, pretty much daily. Me and my manager walk the floor, the production floor, and just check things out. Uh, this happened to be the Monday following our last discipleship uh, training, uh, the training session, second session. And we're walking the floor, and my manager, he routinely asked me, hey, what'd you do Sundays, all my Sundays off? And he's like, did you preach that Sunday? I'm like, no, I didn't, I didn't preach. Um, so I was like, actually, we went out and did prayer walking, and he asked me what that, what that looked like. And so I told him, you know, we go out to the public, and we, we pray over people. We ask him if we can do anything for him, and we even share the three circles. And he asked me what three circles was. So I explained to him, you know, it's a concise way to share the gospel. It's really uh, quick and effective. Uh, he said he'd be interested in, in seeing that. Um, so we are on the floor, so I, we let that pass for a little bit. And, uh, but I put it in my mind, I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do this with this guy. And um, so the night shift comes in, and I'm telling this Christian a, a friend of mine, I'm like, hey, you know, I just talked to our manager, and I'm going to share in the three circles. And he's like, I'd love to see that too. Uh, as soon as you show that to him, show that to me. So the next day, I put this blank piece of paper in my pocket and was just looking for opportunities to, to share that with him. And to be honest with you, I had no desire to do so. I was terrified. Uh, this guy is my, my boss, you know. Um, so I went there about lunchtime. He wasn't in his office. And then I circled back around about 2 o'clock, and he met me walking through, and we just kind of had a brief conversation. And I'm like, all right, I'm not doing this. And I started walking out, and the Holy Spirit's like, no, you're doing it. So I turned back around. And I knock on his door. I'm like, hey, you were interested in the three circles. Can I share that with you? He said, yeah. So we sit down there, and I do the three circles with him. I was like, hey, man, where, where do you see yourself at? And he's like, you know, I'm in, I'm in, I've done all three of them, but right now I sit in the brokenness. I was like, where do you want to be? And he said, you know, I, I want to be in the beauty. And I asked him what, what was the next steps he could take. And he's like, you know, I need to get back in the church. And so I offered him. I was like, you know, I'm, I'm willing to have a Bible study with you. Uh, that's something you'd be interested in. And at that time, he's not. Uh, it's not something he was willing to do. Um, so later that night, the second shift comes in and I was able to tell, I was like, I walked up to that guy and I'm like, Hey, let's go to your office. And I was getting ready to do the three circles with him. And he starts to share with me how he's just been struggling lately and, uh, some of the struggles he was dealing with. And I was able to share a little bit of my testimony that he was unaware of. And, uh, then I did the three circles with him and he was, he hugged me and we were, we were just moved on from the, that evening. So the next morning I come in and that that guy's counterpart on night shift comes up to me and he starts telling me how he, how he serves at Freeway uh, back in the day and now he's in a different church locally here but he seems to be in and out uh, and I just felt like okay uh, do you, do you want to study the Bible together and he's like I, I would absolutely love doing that and so that's something that Jennifer and I have been, been beating around lately is how do we do this house churches and, and make that happen and so we're just looking for an opportunity to do that with this fellow and his wife um, so my last day on shift, I went up to my manager, and I grabbed a card here from Northside, and I gave that to him. I was like, man, you're more than invited to church, though, and uh, I want that yellow light to turn green, you know? Yes. So. <laughs> Praise God. Absolutely, man. Can we just thank JR for sharing that story? I, I just love how JR just 
You know, he, he's just being obedient to the Spirit of God. Haven't you all felt that before? When you're like, man, God is leading you to say something or just share something, and you're nervous to do it for, for a host of many reasons. And the seeds are planted. And then how that opened a door for someone else who opened the door for someone else, and then Jr. is able to share his testimony. And then a guy who's in and out and just not where he needs to be with the Lord right now is saying, man, I'd, I'd like to study the Bible together. What does that look like? And that's what we're going to talk about next. So can we, let's just thank Jr. for sharing his story. I th I'm grateful for that. I appreciate it so much. You know, JR is not just inviting people to church. I mean, he will. He did. You can. But that's not where you have to start. In fact, sometimes there might be a better place to start. Because sometimes there are obstacles and hurdles for people coming to a place that they may already have a negative connotation about for whatever reason. And sometimes there's the hurdles of coming to a place where it feels different and the culture is weird and man, they don't know anybody, they don't know those people and just sometimes there's obstacles and hurdles to coming here that are not present there, not to that degree. JR is already friends with this guy, they already know each other, there's a level of trust, a sharing of stories and for him to say how he'd like to do a Bible study together and they start gathering together. And they start studying God's word with the, the commitment to be obedient to it and to follow it. Over time, that group has the potential to become a church. To do the things in Acts chapter 2 churches do. Where they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, the fellowship to prayer, and to giving to one another's needs. That can happen. With the goal being that that group would then start another group. With people of, in that group friendship circle with people that they live, work, and play with, and they could start another group. From house to house throughout the book of Acts, it's how the world was changed. It's how the gospel went to the world from place to place, house to house, from wherever you are, whenever you meet. It doesn't have to be in a large building. It doesn't require a large budget. It doesn't require sound systems or lighting or even paid staff. It's something that you can be empowered to do where you meet with someone and help them know Jesus and they help someone else to know Jesus so that groups are formed for the purpose of seeing 212 to 227,000 people in Greene County right now who are not following Jesus come to know Jesus because they're not here. And the likelihood of all of them coming here are pretty slim. I think you would agree with that. And so how do we go there? How do we do what Jesus said to go into all the world and to make disciples? I want you to imagine for, for a moment you do something similar to JR, that you just did something similar. Like, what if you just shared your brief 15 second testimony with somebody? Something that looks kind of like this. Over on the far left where it says intro, it says, There was a time in my life when. And, and what if you just filled in those two blanks under the letter A there when you were away from Christ? Meaning, before you experienced the, the saving power of Jesus, when you put your faith and belief and trust in Him. Where you say something like, man, there was a time in my life when I was, I was so broken, pursuing my own pleasures and my own self, and I was guilty in my sins, and I was a sinner, and I was guilty. But because of Jesus, B, because of Jesus, when he died on that cross, he paid the price for my sin. He became a substitute for my sin. He forgave me of my sins. I still remember that day when I believed in Jesus. And confessed my sins and repented. I was baptized into Christ and made brand new. I still remember the day. And you know, because of that, now I've, I've got purpose. I have direction in my life. I, I feel that I can serve God and have meaning in my life. And then D, do you have a story like that? Do you have a story like that that Jesus has done for you? And if the answer is no, then it could be, can I share with you God's story? If the answer is yes, it could be, let me show you something that I've used to help other people who've experienced this just like you have. And you take them through the three circles that JR was just mentioning. And this three circles was something on October 9th. I, I taught to our church family right here in the room. And, and if you were here, you would have seen it. But if you weren't, maybe it's your first time here. You don't, you don't even know what this is. Or maybe you went to one of our disciple trainings and, and you saw the three circles and you, you learned how that can be used as a tool to help share the gospel with somebody. And you just asked the question when you got done with this, you know, where are you? Where are you in that story? 
and say, man, I'm, I'm in brokenness. Well, where do you want to be? I want to be in God's design, his perfect design and beauty. And what's preventing you from getting there? Are you ready to believe? Are you ready to repent? Are you ready to be baptized into Christ? And, and when you find someone who's a green light or even someone who's a yellow light to, who's interested in, in pursuing more about God, the question becomes, what do you do next? What's next? Where do you go from there? How do you help people that you live and you work and you play with, that you're encountering? How, how do you help equip them so that they can get into a group where they begin to study the Bible with the emphasis on obedience and with the intent that they could become a disciple who makes other disciples? How do you do this? This is actually critically important if we're going to see the gospel go out into the world. You could help lead that group, but even better yet, what if you equipped and trained someone else to lead that group? So as they led it, someone else could lead it so we can reproduce and multiply. Around the world, it's been discovered that only about one in four discover groups who start meeting for the purpose of studying the Bible and obeying it actually become a church. It's, it's similar, to the four, uh, similar to the four soils that Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower, where only one of them was good soil that was multiplying. About one in four actually get to that point where they become a church and they begin to multiply other churches. Disciple making takes time. And one of the principles in disciple making is you go slow to go fast. It, it's slow to get started, but once it goes and multiplies, or reproduces, I should say, once it reproduces, then all of a sudden you get on a fast track to, towards multiplication and it outpaces population growth, which is something that the church in America right now is not doing. We're not growing faster than our birth rate, but if we could get a multiplication movement going, then it could happen. The more people that get involved, the more people that we will reach. And, and when I talk about a, a discovery group, I'm talking about the kind of group where you become involved in making disciples. Unfortunately, in many churches, the attitude is that ordinary people are supposed to just sit in church while the real professionals and the paid people do the work. But that is just not what Matthew 28, the Great Commission, says. It says every believer, the disciples were to make other disciples and teach them to obey everything Jesus was commanding them, which is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything he commanded them. This is not just for paid staff or for someone trained in seminary. Chris Galanos, in his book, Megachurch to Multiplication, he says churchgoers don't typically hear the term disciple-maker and think, that's me. He says most churchgoers don't hear the word disciple maker and think, that's me. Even fewer people attending church hear the word like church planter and think, that could be me. Because they think it has to be someone who's in seminary, or someone who's got some kind of degree, or someone who's a trained professional, but that's not God's intention at all. And this is the reason that Christianity is not keeping up with the birth rate in the United States and why we're not growing as a church in this country. Because if we're going to reach people and see millions come to Christ, then ordinary Christians have to be empowered to believe that God wants to use them to make disciples. God wants to see them multiply disciples who make disciples. And there's even a chance some of you sitting in this room right now or listening online, you're, you, you just feel, you felt shackled. Like you wanted to do more. You just didn't know how or what. If you had permission, we're telling you, you've got permission. Yeah, there should be accountability and coaching and training and growth and all of that. But you can do this. You are a disciple who can make disciples. We've got to empower ordinary people once again. Because this is what was happening in the book of Acts, the beginning of the church, like in Acts chapter 4. When Peter and John, I mean, these guys, these guys were fishermen, right? They were being interrogated by the Sanhedrin because they were now followers of Jesus making disciples. This Jewish ruling council was interrogating them and trying to put the fear of God in them. They didn't realize they already had the fear of God in them because in Acts 4.13 it says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note, these men have been with Jesus. That's what's required. Not a degree, not a paid profession. You just got to be with Jesus. 
you got to spend time with Jesus. And when you spend time with Jesus, you can make disciples who make disciples. And they had spent time with Jesus. It was obvious. And upon their release, they go back to the believers, and they were celebrating their faithfulness to the Lord, and they begin to pray for boldness, that they would speak with boldness, even though they have been told to be silent. And they, they not only pray, they prayed that God would heal, and that God would do miraculous signs and wonders, and the church was filled with boldness and encouragement, and it says they were one in heart and mind. The church was on mission for God. And our mission here at Northside is to connect people to Christ and one another by making disciple makers. That's what we're about. And here's our vision. We, we want to multiply self-initiated, reproducing, fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's our vision, that we would multiply self-initiating, reproducing, fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, that you would be empowered to help make disciples. I mean, that's the Paul model. The, Paul, the first missionary sent from the church to go into the world, his model, he would go into a, a, a synagogue, and he would teach, and he would find people who were open, yellow lights, green lights. He would help pull them out of the synagogue and teach them and train them about Jesus, how to make disciples, and those people would go and make disciples. And today there are people in modern day synagogues who long for more and they just need to be released to go to the edges. We need to invite people into the joy and the intimacy and the excitement that comes when you actually get on mission for God and start doing what Jesus did and doing what Jesus told you to do. You'll start experiencing joy and excitement because we want to see Acts happen today. We want to see the book of Acts happen today. We want to see the church participating. In fact, church services in the early church were highly participatory. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 26 through 33, every person was bringing a word of instruction or a hymn or a message from God. They, they were sharing with one another. And so what I want to do for the next few moments we have together is share a tool, a tool that you could use, you could implement right now. In fact, you could start doing this with your family. Like if you want to disciple your family and disciple your children, you can start using this tool right now to do it. It's called the three-thirds tool. You can start doing it with your family. But it's also something that JR could do and probably will do with anybody who wants to get into Bible study with him. It's something that, that you could do with some people at work, uh, with some friends, uh, with some family that want to gather together and want to engage with God's Word. And here's the thing about the three-thirds that we're going to talk through. This is different. This is different than Sunday school class or uh, a sermon or a life group or any of those other groups you've done before. This is different. And one of the things that really makes it different is its emphasis on obedience and disciple-making. There are three parts to this tool called three-thirds. There are three parts to it where it, it just divides your time together into three parts so you can practice obeying some of the most important things that Jesus commands. And those three parts are to look back, look up, and look forward. To look back, look up, look forward. In our life groups, we've been kind of using some of that terminology, though we haven't been doing everything that we're to do in a three-thirds group. But we like the terminology, to look back, look up, and look forward. And, and this tool is, is how we can lead people from spiritual conversations to actually becoming disciples of Jesus. The goal for this tool is that it be simple, reproducible. Anybody can do it. Anybody who's following Jesus can do it. Three sections, three-thirds, each section broken up into a third. And the first section is this. It's look back. Look back. This is a third of your time. A third of your time is spent just looking back. And here's the, the components of look back. It's care and prayer. You care and pray for each other. And what's gone on over the past week since you've been together? Vision casting, reminding each other why we're meeting, what this is about, and then checking in. This is loving, grace-filled accountability of, of since the last time we met, those things you said you were going to do and the people you were going to share it with and, and how you're, you know, did, did you do it? How did it go? What was that like? And if you didn't get an opportunity, maybe that's something maybe this week we can pray about that you have that opportunity to do it. And so it's, it's loving accountability that most of our groups don't have. It's called the three-thirds. And I just want to go through those three things right there at the bottom, care and prayer, vision casting, checking. And let's start with care and prayer for a minute. What, what does that mean, to care for each other? Well, yeah, you can share highs and lows and that kind of thing, but really the best way to start is just to say, you know, what are you thankful for? 
from this week? What are you thankful? What are you grateful for? It's how a lot of these groups start because gratitude is a critical ingredient. Gratitude. In fact, I want to talk about this for a moment, and I'm going to spend a little more time on this than I would have otherwise just going through this because this week is Thanksgiving week. Thursday, we, we're, we're celebrating Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving Day, but that doesn't mean that we're necessarily becoming more grateful. Nor does it mean we're necessarily really expressing gratitude. We could be going through the motions and not be growing in that, and yet I want to pause for a minute. In fact, let's call this a mini-sermon inside the sermon. I want to give you a little mini-sermon about gratitude, because this is Thanksgiving week. So this is my mini-sermon inside of a sermon, which for most of you, you just know that means this is going to be a longer sermon, so that's probably true. That's probably true. Gratitude is so important. In fact, there's over 400 Bible verses that reference either Thanksgiving or gratitude. And God expects gratitude to be the primary motivation behind everything in our lives. Like, it's the primary attitude that should undergird everything. Like in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Like, that's His will, that in everything we have a spirit of gratitude. Second, we know from the Bible that God rewards gratitude, and there's a long list of blessings and benefits that come with gratitude. And that's not just scriptural, That's even scientific. Scientific studies have come along in recent years that echo many of these benefits and blessings that the scriptures talk about when it comes to gratitude. Rick Warren shared some of these benefits and blessings that I'm going to share with you. And, you know, the first one is this gratitude improves our brain and it improves physical health. Now, we know this from scripture, but we also know this from doctors and And from the health community, the scientific community, doctors say that gratitude is the healthiest human emotion. Gratitude, the healthiest human emotion. It improves your brain. It improves your physical health. It's why in Proverbs 17 it says, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. So gratitude improves your health. It improves your brain function. Secondly is this, gratitude creates happiness. It creates happiness. The happiest people on the earth are those who are most grateful. Focusing on the good things that God has done in your life. It brings you joy. In fact, David wrote about that in Psalm 126. The Lord has done great things for you, and we are filled with joy. We're filled with joy. Third, gratitude is the antidote to toxic emotions. Those toxic emotions in our life, depression, worry, anger, fear, they're all overcome by gratitude. It's hard to be grateful and those at the same time. That's why Paul in Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds of Christ Jesus. God does it. He does the work of that. But, but when you do it with thanksgiving, with gratitude to God, when you include gratitude as an attitude in your life, it changes the toxic emotions. Number four, gratitude improves relationships. It improves relationships. In fact, you express gratitude to someone this week, to your family, to a spouse, to a child, to a coworker, and you just say to them that, why, that you are grateful for them and just tell you why you're so thankful for them. It will improve your relationship. Try it. Do it. It, it, it enhances our relationships. Number five, gratitude opens the door to people and opportunities. When you walk around with a critical spirit or a negative spirit, your opportunities are diminished. But when you walk around with gratitude, thankfulness, you gain opportunities. You gain open doors into people's lives that you wouldn't have otherwise. Number six, gratitude is the evidence of spiritual maturity. When you see someone who's expressing gratitude and they're thankful, that is a sign of growth. And so in Colossians 2, 7, it says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. One of those signs that you are rooted, growing, maturing, being built up, is that you have a thankful, grateful spirit. It says you're rooted in him 
Just saying the word rooted reminds me of Friday night. We had a rooted celebration dinner. It was awesome. It was incredible, powerful. Cardboard test, people sharing their testimonies. Three people were baptized Friday night. We had people shouting out that they believed and were repenting of their sins. It was just an incredible night. People who are becoming more rooted in Christ. Number seven, gratitude pleases God and brings his blessing. Gratitude pleases God and brings his blessing. Like in Psalm 50, it says, those who sacrifice, thank offerings, thank offerings to me, honor me. And to the blameless, I will show salvation. This is what gratitude can do. And and Rick Warren said this. He said, it has always baffled me that we spend very little time on Thanksgiving Day actually giving thanks to God. We spend hours preparing the meal, watching football, hanging out with family. Then we may spend a few minutes thanking God before the meal. But just like you enjoy hearing your children say thank you, God enjoys it when we stop our busy lives or even our Thanksgiving celebrations, to express gratitude to him and to one another. And that's really my challenge to you this week, is that you would express gratitude more intentionally, greater regularity than you would have otherwise. And you'll be blessed and others will be blessed before it, and your relationships will be enhanced. So start with thanks. Okay, so that's my mini-sermon inside the sermon. That was it. That was my Thanksgiving sermon. Because that's that's how three-thirds starts. What are you thankful for? So we look back. We look back over the last week, and we just say, you know, what are you thankful for? And then we can go to this. Then we say, well, what what struggles or what, what challenges, what hardships did you have this week? And so we can share struggles with one another. And if in that we see something that need, there's a need that needs to be met, we can start working on meeting that need and even meeting with them afterwards to help care for them. And then we take a few moments in that looking back section just to cast some vision. Say, remember why we're doing this? Because we love God and we love people because we're here to make disciples because we want to be obedient, as Christ said, to be in Matthew chapter 7 because we want to be the wise builder. How do you become a wise builder, not a foolish one? By obeying what Jesus says. So we want to be obedient. And that leads you into this next thing that you do in that looking back section. That's checking in. You check in with each other. You, you, you encourage the group to share how they did in regard to the commitments they made at the last meeting, the things that they said God was showing them or teaching them to obey. And in that grace-filled accountability, you you just talk about and celebrate, what did God do? What did God do this past week? And when you said you were going to share with the person, how did that go? Did it happen? And what was it like? What was their response? And it's just a time to follow up since our last time. How did we follow God this week? And we hear and we listen to one another. And when someone says, man, I I really didn't get a good opportunity for that. And let's let's pray that God would give that to you this week. Let's just hang on to that and keep praying for it. It's it's a way to check in. How have you obeyed? And and, and who are you sharing with? And how are you being trained? Who are you training to do this? And so it's it's a check-in. So all of that is what we do with the first third of our time. We we look back. And then what we do next is we, we look up. This is the next third of our time. We look up where we pray to, in that moment to talk with God simply and briefly that he would teach us from his word. And then we read. We read his word. In some cultures, they listen to the word because maybe they don't have the ability to read. So we read or we listen to his word and then we discuss it. We talk with it together and we ask questions like, what does this passage say? What does it teach us about God? What does it teach us about people or about ourselves? What do you find challenging or hard to understand in this passage? What, what should we obey or who should we, what should we obey in response to it and who should we share it with? And we make sure that everybody has an opportunity to read it and discuss it and think through it and, and to make application of it and talk about what it's saying. We want everybody involved in that process of discovery. That's why it's called a discovery Bible study. This is different than what's happening right now. In a discovery Bible study, it's what we call an inductive Bible study, everybody is participating and discovering it together and learning together and say, oh, well, look, it says this, and and they're in the process of discovering. And that makes all the difference because when you discover it, you own it. When you discover it, you remember it. That's why when we walk away today on this Sunday, the person in this room 
who's going to remember what we read today and what we've come to understand today and, and the points that are being made today. I mean, you tell me, who's going to remember it the most? Go ahead and say it. Me. Because this is a lecture. And I've been wrestling with this this week, and I've been thinking about this this week. I've spent hours and hours just thinking about this and praying about this and working through this. So who's going to walk away today having discovered something from God's Word the most? And the answer is Wayne Bushnell. How's that helpful to you? Well, you're praying for the Holy Spirit right now to help you capture the things that are resonating and the things that God speaks to you. It's not that God doesn't speak through messages or preaching. He does, and he did in the early church too. It's not that he doesn't, but the way you own it and the way you're going to obey it the most is if you're involved in the process of discovering it. And so in these groups, you discover it together. It's like the parable of the soil, and it was the soil that, that took it and its roots grew deep and, and it, it held on to it. That was the one that grew the most, and it began to multiply. And so we look up, and then we do this. After we look up to God's word and see what it says and ask, how do we obey this? What's he showing us? Then we look forward. We've already looked back. That was a third of our time. We looked up to God, and now we're looking forward. And when we look forward, we're going to pray. We're going to obey. We're going to identify ways we can obey this. We're, we're going to talk about how we can train for this, and we're going to share it. And so we take at least five minutes in silent prayer, where every person just prays for the Holy Spirit to show them how to answer these questions. And in that prayer, they make a commitment to obey whatever God would have them to do. And, and so we ask these questions. How will I apply and obey this message, this passage from God? How am I going to obey this? And then we write down, who does God want me to share this with? And, or who could I train in this so that they could use this? Who does God want me to share this with? And who does want me to train this with? Whenever we kind of identify that, someone can be kind of writing that down. Here's what God's telling us today and what we're going to do. And then if it's a kind of a, little, a larger group, maybe there's 10 people or 12 people in the group, we break down into groups of two or three, and, and we just begin to kind of practice it. Okay, so you said that one of the things you want to obey is that, that you want to fight this temptation that's been battling you the way Jesus did it. So let's, let's practice that. When the temptation comes, what would you do? What would that look like? Maybe for you, you say, I really want to share with my neighbor I just want to share my 15-second testimony this week. Well, let's let you just pretend I'm your neighbor and just practice that. Just walk through that. Just practice it together and, and just role play through that so that we are, we're learning together. And then in those same groups of two or three, you can just pray and talk to God and ask God to prepare the hearts of the people that you might be sharing with, praying for him to, to work in your life, to prepare your heart. This is what a three-thirds group looks like. It looks back, it looks up, it looks forward. And as this group begins to grow together, it has all the ingredients possible to grow into a church, which is what Acts 2 would do, which means that they're meeting together and, and, and they're, they're learning God's Word together and they're being obedient to the words and they're praying together. They're, they're breaking bread together, taking the Lord's Supper together, and they're giving to meet needs. This is what it looks like to do this. And so we want to do this and grow so that we can see a multiplication movement. This graphic you see on the screen just kind of summarizes it. It's look, looking back, I mean, you just do care and prayer. You, you share gratitude, you share challenges. Then you vision cast and you, you check in with graceful accountability about how it went since your last meeting. And then looking up, you pray, and then you just read, listen, and discuss God's word. And then you look forward. You pray, obey, train, and share with other people. The process is simple. Curriculum is the Bible. The teacher is the Holy Spirit. The priority is obedience. And the result is multiplication. It's happening around the world. It's happening in the United States. And what we would like to do is to see these kinds of groups started in our community as well. Beyond just the Sunday morning gathering we have right now, we'd love to see these kinds of groups started in our community where disciple-making happens. Because just coming in and learning lesson after lesson, week after week, that's not disciple-making. Disciple making is doing it. It's kind of like how many of you have ever taught your child how to drive a, a stick shift? For some reason, I'm having a hard time coming up with the words. 
Yeah, stick shift. How many of you ever taught a kid how to drive a stick shift, right? I mean, when you're telling, you can describe it to them all you want. You can tell them how it goes and the clutch and, and the brake and the gas and you can push the cl- clutch. You can still coast and you can brake slowly and then tell them what to do on a hill. I mean, you can do all that. But they're not going to do it successfully. They're not going to learn it until they actually do it. You can model it. But there comes a time when you've got to assist and watch and watch them do it so they can learn it. And my prayer today is even in the conversation we're having right now is you would be one of those who would be a green light, maybe even a yellow light, say, you know what, I'm intrigued. And say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try this. Maybe I start with my own family. Maybe I start with, with some buddies or some friends, some friends at work. But I, I'm, I'm going to do this. Because I want to be an effective trainer. I want to be an effective disciple maker. And I want, to, I want to start being a part of this. And that's my prayer today, that you would do it. And you know, one simple way you could do it is with your phone. In fact, you could even take out your phone right now. And, and uh, on the screen is, is a video I made this morning. I just was laying in bed and, and just recorded my screen. And this is, this is called the Waha app. And so I'm clicking on this. And and right now, there's, there's like 13 lessons from the beginning until the birth of Jesus for this little thing right here. And I, I'm going to click on this one at the top, creation. And, and you can hit play, and it'll walk you through, through the three-thirds. But I click show text and so you, we can all see it. And it starts off with the fellowship, the stuff I was talking about, care kind of questions up there. And what stressed you out? And what needs do you see? And, and then with the story, reading the text. So that now we're looking up, and you read the text. And... Then when you get to the bottom of the text, there's questions, application. And so, you know, what does this teach us about God, about people? How do you apply it? Who will share a truth? You know, who will we share this with? And so it's a process. So the the Waha app allows you to to walk through this. where You you can just, right there at the dinner table, have this app on your phone and use it with your family, or you can use it with with a a group at work or or at church. And so anyway, I go back, and I went back to this, because from beginning until the birth of Jesus, I decided, let's do a different plan. So financial studies, I I swiped over to the life and message of Jesus. Same thing. And you click on it, and it goes through the same process again. So if you want this app, it's Waha, W-A-H-A. Waha, Waha. Maybe that'll help you remember it, but but here's the bad news. Um, After a nine o'clock service, someone said, I downloaded Waha. I was like, all right. They said it was a dating app. (laughs) Well, that's the wrong one. (laughs) Apparently, there's another app where you go on a date, and then you're like, (laughs) that's not what I wanted. And so don't do that. Don't do, we'll call that the Waha app. We want you to do the Waha app. Did that make sense, Corey? Is that clear? I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Waha. I don't know what's going on. W-H-A. Waha. And so it's a great tool to go through the three-thirds. And, and we just want to encourage you with this because this is what it means to help make disciples. Is we, we want to learn to do this better. And, and here's one of the ways we can help you with this too. Uh, on January 15th, it's a Sunday afternoon at 2.30. We're going to do trainings, one, two, and three. Every time we do this, we learn a little something. We tweak some stuff. And if you haven't been to session one or two or three, come. We're doing all three on January 15th at 2.30 p.m. I'm going to invite you to come to that because we'll help you learn how to do this better. And you know what? Maybe right now you're a red light. Like, I'm not, this is not appealing to me at all. I'm not interested in this. It's okay. I'm just going to pray that God would just do an empowering work in your life that we're not only would you come to know him even deeper, but where you could even see how you could be engaged or involved in whatever ways. And I know some of you right now, you're already engaged and involved with what God's doing right here, and we, we can keep doing that. But for some who are yellow, like, I'm intrigued, I want to learn more, green lights, we, we just want to invite you on a journey where you go deeper in the faith, you become a disciple of Jesus who helps others become a disciple of Jesus, and you become a disciple maker, you do. When majority of Christians in the United States of America have never led anyone to Christ. We think we can help change that. And you could lead someone to Jesus. Who would lead someone else to Jesus? And that's our prayer. So as you stand to your feet right now, I'd love to meet and talk and pray with you. Maybe you just want to pray about that today. Maybe today you want to begin a relationship with Jesus. 
Maybe you want to be baptized into Christ. Maybe you just want prayer for something you're going through. Maybe you want to know what your next step is. I'd love to talk with you at Decision Point right through these doors. Or if you're watching online, just go to northsidechristianchurch.net slash decision. So, Lord, I just pray that we would hear from your spirit right now. You would prompt us to do what you would have us to do. Lord, I pray that we'd be obedient to you. We'd be faithful to you. Lord, we would be effective witnesses for you who share the change that you've made in our lives, the story of Jesus that we've come to know because someone shared it with us. Lord, I pray that we would find ways to be more effective in making disciples and that we would invite people into a discovery Bible study where we can grow in faith together. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.